to second grade. Today we're going to invite uh, anyone who's up to fifth grade to go to kids camp. And it's really up to you as parents. If you want your kids to stay here, you're welcome to have them do that. Uh, there's nothing terribly um, problematic for young children in the, in the sermon today. I've already heard it once. But for some of you as parents, you may be more comfortable having your older elementary kids in kids camp this morning. And so Pastor Stephanie is at the back of the sanctuary and she is ready for our children to go once we pray for them. So why don't we pause for a moment of prayer and bless them as they go. God, we give you thanks for each of our children in the life of this church and for the opportunity that they have to grow and learn and develop in their faith as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, God, to do all that we can do as a church to nurture the lives of these, our youngest disciples, so that they might be lifelong followers of Jesus. We ask your blessing for them now as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to dismiss our children up to the fifth grade that are with us this morning to go to kids camp with Pastor Stephanie. And let's continue on our worship. to show it. Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked, who never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Some might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice and in faithful action. It's good that you believe God is one. <laughs> Even demons believe this and they tremble with fear. Are you so slow? Do you need to be shown that faith without actions has no value at all? This is the word of the Lord. So, do you ever get tired of questions, I say, as I ask the question? <laughs> this summer, our family took a long road trip down the coast of California, and let me tell you, there were lots of questions. How much longer? <laughs> How hot is it? Who ate all the chips? What's that smell? <laughs> And those of us that are parents really get tired of the why questions, don't we, after a while. When I was a teacher, we used many intentional questions to uh, check for understanding, to engage our students in critical thinking and discussion. We used open-ended, probing questions, process and evaluative questions, to name a few. I really like being the one to ask the questions. I don't so love being on the other end, expected to come up with a brilliant answer on the spot. So I don't know if you noticed, but James sure knows how to use questions to get his point across. He, in this passage read today, uh, asked seven questions in just these six verses alone. And speaking of questions, does this passage raise some pretty big questions for you? If it does, you are not alone. What's the deal? I thought we were saved by God's grace alone because of our faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something we possessed. It's not something we did that we can be proud of. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this. Is James contradicting this truth? Is he telling us that we actually have to do good things to save ourselves? How do we figure out the actions God really wants from us? If these are some of your questions, you are not alone. This is truly a difficult passage. And most scholars believe that James is likely the brother of Jesus. Yet, in the very first verse of this book, he calls himself a slave to Jesus. 
His identity is totally submitted to Christ. Now, James is written to the Israelites scattered outside their land, and they're experiencing alienation and challenges to their identity. It's a difficult time. So being a Christian is not just believing certain things are true, but it's a growing awareness of God's gracious love that surrounds me, and it's starting in, to trust in a Jesus who can, who's the only one who can forgive my sins through his death, his life, his resurrection. This Jesus longs to be in relationship with me, and this is the unearned gift that God freely gives me. So in all his letters, Paul especially emphasizes the truth of salvation by grace alone. And James, on the other hand, shines a light on what we're to do after we're saved. So in this section that was read for us, James points out what we do actually proves our faith is real and alive. He questions how talking the talk without walking the walk does anything at all. <laughs> It would be the same thing as if one of us spoke to one of our foster youth that came in out of the coal with little to wear, hungry and in need, and we said, be warm, may your tummy be full of good food, God bless you, and we sent them on their way without anything, without any provisions. What good would that do? Would they be impacted by our well wishes? Of course not. <laughs> we know better. It would mean absolutely nothing. So working with foster youth, I have had to grow in my patience in communication. <laughs> I've had to learn to be very clear and repeat often what to expect, when to meet, uh, what our plan is, where to go, what we had to offer. I really didn't understand why I had to do this over and over again because of course things would work out the first time exactly the way I said <laughs> until, a fo until a social worker graciously took me aside and t revealed to me that these young adults have been told so many lies and been given so many empty promises by adults in their lives. They have been conditioned for letdowns, and they no longer believe that anyone is ever going to follow through. And also, all adults must have nefarious motives. So in this same way, when we fail to follow the example of Jesus in our actions, our faith is as dead as useless words are to these people in need. So dead. Dead here does not mean non-existent, but inactive or dormant lifeless, like a body without air. Faith, works in, it, faith without works is no more living than a corpse without breath <laughs> is to a, a living person. So our faithful actions are not to be viewed as added extras any more than breath is to be taken as a bonus to a living person. Faith and works, life and breath, they go together. One cannot exist without the other. The Jesus follower who does not respond to those in need looks like one whose faith is dead or even make-believe. So James then brings up another person in re a person's response in verse 18. Someone might claim, you have faith, I have actions. This could be a person who says, I keep my faith to myself. It's a private thing. But James challenges that authentic faith can only be recognized through faithful actions. It's clear throughout the book of James that one of the key works that Christ followers are expected to do is care for the poor. Earlier in chapter 2, James condemns favoritism to the rich and elevates the status of the poor. My dear brothers and sisters, listen, hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom? He has promised to those who love him. Next, James selects the demons as an illustration, possibly because they are the most extreme beings whose simplistic belief is correct, but whose behavior is totally not. Far from it. Simply saying God is one, meaning the acknowledgement that there is only one God doesn't get you very anywhere. It totally doesn't, if it doesn't make a difference in your life. 
We need a fuller, deeper, richer, Jesus-shaped action. Both Paul and James would agree that what really matters is faith working through love, found in Galatians 5, 6. So as we've served foster young adults in Seattle, in the Seattle area with quality home goods, furniture, and food, I've had several social workers and youth ask why. Why are we doing what we do? What could we hopefully, possibly hope to get in return? Before we came along, churches and volunteers paid special, weren't paying any attention to the adolescents, and they especially enjoyed the little kids and babies who smiled in return. We didn't just say that we cared about teens. We holistically and effectively responded to their needs. Our compassionate actions have opened many doors for our team members and myself to share words of faith and love. We seek to help foster youth recognize they are valued and worthy of good, a good future to begin to glimpse a God who really loves them and a that there's a community of trusted folks who will rally around them in support. I think we can all agree here that James makes an excellent case that our authentic faith needs to be lived out in faithful actions. But how do we do that? Once I accepted this gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit came to live in me. And the Holy Spirit equips me and pushes me to do good works. Not so that I can be saved or to keep my salvation. Nothing can take that away. But out of a loving response to all that God has done for me in Jesus. We are not saved by deeds. We are saved for deeds. So let's picture it another way. As a Jesus follower, I am equipped by the Holy Spirit to be victorious with this racket of faithful activities, <laughs> which is necessary to hit this ball representing my faith. One that does no good in, in tennis or in life without the other. <laughs> and Jesus is my coach and my partner. So my racket of faithful activities what is it? It consists of things like right living, which would be prayer and reading and studying the Bible, and accountability with other believers and worship. There's love and concern for others, especially caring for those in, on the margins. We might start by asking, who did Jesus pay special attention to? And what were his faithful activities while he was on earth? We are called to love our neighbors. Not only that, but we are called to love our enemies and pray for those who harass us. We represent justice, equity, and freedom for all, to name a few things. <laughs> and we are called to introduce people to Jesus. On this Freedom Sunday, it's especially important to be reminded of who we are and what we are called to do. Let's watch this video that shows us just those things. Justice. In 1860, B.T. Roberts and other leaders in the Methodist Episcopal Church were abolitionists and very critical of their church for not denouncing slavery. When they left the denomination to form the Free Methodist Church, they became supporters in the anti-slavery movement and believed in equality for all, regardless of ethnic background. Many early Free Methodists were also active in the operation of the Underground Railroad, which helped enslaved African Americans escape into free states in Canada. Today, we continue to pursue diversity and call out systematic and racial injustice in our communities, our country, and around the world. We continue the anti-slavery movement by taking a stand against human trafficking, sexual exploitation, domestic servitude, and forced labor. Free Methodists introduce people to Jesus, change the world one person at a time, and alleviate suffering. We are still free. So this is our calling for all believers, for Free Methodists, for those of us in Seattle, for those of us in this congregation, for us as individuals. Our racket of faithful activities represents a holistic understanding of personal and social aspects. Wesley often said we should provoke each other on to love and good deeds. 
So this racket of faithful activities is quite large. <laughs> so how do I know what good things I should do? After all, our mission statement says, love people, connect to Jesus, and serve the world. That doesn't narrow it down very much, does it? <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I like to people watch. And I especially like to do that at big events and new places in our city. And maybe you do too. And when you do, think about who are the people that catch your attention? Maybe these are people you especially wonder about. Is it people who appear to be living on the streets? Maybe seniors or people with disabilities, people that uh, teenagers seeking out their identity, maybe sweet little toddlers. Um, perhaps people of certain ethnic origins. Maybe you find yourself drawn to certain people groups and movies and books, people that consistently make your heart ache or bring you joy and make your heart sing. This can be the Holy Spirit stirring an awareness in you and a longing for you to respond. God uses our experiences, our, our longings, our education, gifts, and talents to tune us in to certain people that we can have a unique connection in service with him. This would be like hitting the sweet spot on our racket. It's also known as the center of percussion, and it's the place that provides the best feel and the most stability on a shot. It's a place where a combination of factors results in the maximum response for a given amount of effort. In other words, you get more power with every hit right here in this little spot. Thank you, Wilson, for providing a W. It's right at the bottom of the W. And you can find it on a pickleball paddle or a badminton or even a golf club. Everyone who plays knows when you hit that spot, you have more power. So that's the sweet spot. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So with my background in education, I've always been drawn to kids. Ever since I was a teenager, I have taught Sunday school. And part of the reason I chose to attend SPU was the opportunities I would have to serve in a big city. I signed up for a whole lot of different ministry experiences, and I believed I would become an elementary teacher in the Rainier Valley. I definitely felt called to love and serve the people of Seattle. And I admit, <laughs> that time as an undergrad was 30 years ago, I kind of hate to admit that, but my life has taken many unexpected twists and turns since then. I've had lots of experiences with faithful activities that I didn't even anticipate. God has expanded my call, and I have matured through my journey with Jesus and experiences and mentors in my life, some are, that are here today, and I am so grateful. I had no idea that my heart would absolutely melt over foster kids and all who care for them until I filled in for a volunteer who was sick one night for our foster family support group. And I held toddlers, and I colored with a shy first grader, and I listened to foster parents as they laughed and cried in the face of an enormously broken system. And I was changed. I could no longer sit on the sidelines while others did this important work. Many of you have made this discovery with me, and you have stepped further into serving sacrificially together. And we uncovered the staggering number together, that there are over 500 kids and teens who are sex trafficked in King County every day. And an estimated of up to 80% of those have been in the foster care system at some point. In response, we launched Fostering Hope Seattle to come alongside these foster youth as they age out, some as early as 18 years old, and they get their first place on their own. So we set them up with new and nearly new home essentials to give them a sense that they are highly valued and they are precious and cared for. 
We have cleaning supplies and personal care kits and, and clothing gift cards and a food pantry as well. Many of you have given sacrificially to fund this important work. We are so deeply grateful. We average serving about one foster youth or foster family a week with our supply room. Now our foster family support group is also still thriving. Just last week we met after the summer break and some of those parents uh, share with me that they just could not imagine parenting without all that our group has to offer, the support and the childcare and the meal and coming together in community. We also meet regularly with social workers uh, to encourage them and to ask how we could be more effective partners in their work. You have stepped up, you've stepped in, giving your time, energy, and expertise to serve these amazing people well. I'd like to take a moment to highlight just two of our awesome Fostering Hope team members who are powerfully hitting their sweet spot. Cheryl Hargesheimer started by coming to me and asking what donations she could gather for our ministry. You see, she and Cheryl Ann are excellent thrifty shoppers. And I, in the meantime, I learned that she is a retired social worker, so I invited her to engage further. And we have so benefited from her kindness and her resourcefulness and her experience. She asks excellent strategic questions. And I love having her be our greeter at our foster support dinners every month. She just last week met a social worker and a youth in our space, and it was wonderful. So Brian Thorne, he is a statistician for sports teams such as the Sounders, Seattle Storm, and the Huskies. He's also discovered a passion for serving those in the foster community. Brian has applied his incredible ability for processes to create an amazing inventory system for our Fostering Hope supply room. And along with his mom, Carol, Brian has combined his love of cooking with an organized system to supply our first church kitchen with a freezer full of homemade meals called ministry meals to share with foster youth and families and everyone in our community who needs extra encouragement. Brian and Carol also helped to coordinate the meals for our support groups. I could go on and I wish I had the time emphasizing the efforts of others. These are just a couple of people who are serving from a sweet place of vocation, of faith and joy, and what they're doing is transformational. So let's go back to that question. How can you know what good things to do? I always encourage starting with prayer. When we are opening ourselves daily to walk with Jesus, we are asking what he would have us to do. We are ready to respond. How do we know what to do? We say yes to opportunities to serve. We take some risks. We practice our shots. Don't just stop at one thing. So I think our four kids actually have a heart to serve, partly because we consistently expose them to lots of different opportunities, both inside and outside the church. When they were in preschool and early elementary, we served with them at the Queen Anne Care Center monthly, and they passed out songbooks and they read scripture to the older folks there at assisted living. And by the way, we still have some amazing faithful people that continue that ministry if you're interested in being a part of that. And starting at a young age, we served as greeters alongside our kids. They helped with vacation Bible school and Sunday school, as well as the yard projects and home projects at Penny's Place. And we did the, foster, the child care at foster support groups as well. So these were things we did as a family. And they did it with people in this church who affirmed them. And they, they actually enjoyed it, believe it or not. Our kids gained confidence and grew in their love for people. And all four have talked about being foster or adoptive parents someday. And they're open to being called into missions. So many of you know my 18-year-old son, Caleb. He knew all about the statistics about trafficking in Seattle. 
And he was emotionally moved by the women caught in prostitution on Aurora when we drove home that way one night. So he initiated a prayer walk for our faith community. Several of you took the leap and you responded to this invitation. And on that stormy day, we gave out prayer. We gave out uh, bags with hand warmers and granola bars. And we prayed for the spirit to be unleashed and for freedom to be felt there. We will never know if there is any connection, but two women were rescued within days of our concentrated prayers. Some of you have been asking me, what more can we do here on Aurora? How can the issue of prostitution be growing before our very eyes in our city? Our hearts are breaking. I have invited community outreach expert Lisa Odell to join us on Sunday, October 23rd at 6 p.m. She's coming to us from REST, which stands for Real Escape from the Sex Trade, and she will lead us in a very important conversation about sex trafficking in Seattle. There'll be time for questions and answers. You will not want to miss this evening. Lisa's FBI husband has shared that our area has the most cases of sex trafficking of any in the United States. This is shocking and it's heartbreaking. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> I always tremble and squirm in my seat when I learn more about the darkness and the huge needs around me and where I might, I might be called to step in. It's, it's risky. This calling to embody our faith is sacrificial. If you look to the end of James, he raises up Abraham and Rahab as examples. So Abraham's faith was made complete through his total surrender of his promised son Isaac from Isaac, he, he, he surrendered him on the altar in obedience to God. He acted out of faith that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And God provided a substitute. And Rahab, Rahab was a prostitute, a pagan woman who believed God. And she risked her very life and the lives of her family to protect God's messengers. So both Abraham and Rahab, they surrendered their futures and they acted out of faith and what who God was and what God could do. And guess what? Both are named in the lineage of Christ so that everyone on earth is ultimately blessed through their faithful actions. So let's look ahead to B.T. Roberts, who you saw on that video. He's the founder of our Free Methodist denomination, and he, he and a few others, they broke away from the Methodists as you heard, do in large part because of the preferential treatment of the wealthy and because of their support of slavery. He and his wife, Ellen, felt called to sell their home, their possessions, and buy a place of worship in the very heart of the city. So they opened a mission above a saloon in, the, in Buffalo's Five Points area where almost every building had a brothel and a bar. Pretty big, scary stuff. Young women victimized by prostitution came to know Jesus, and they moved in with their family of three young children until they were healed and could care for themselves in what they called a respectable way. And as B.T. Roberts became busier with preaching, his wife Ellen ran more and more of this ministry. What a model of authentic faith in action. Out of obedience, they laid everything on the line. Their money, their family, their health, their reputation. For the people that the Holy Spirit had called B.T. and Ellen to serve. God is still using that risky yes to transform lives through our denomination and through the set free movement. So back home, every time I listen to the foster parents in our support group, I marvel at their courage. Their courage to love in the face of trauma and loss. They love the children that come into their homes with an unknown past. Most of these kids will be part of their lives from an unknown amount of time and will lead them at some undetermined point. Yet they love and they give fully of themselves. This is the kind of security a foster child needs. What an example. 
I look around our circle and I think about the over 10,000 foster kids in Washington waiting for permanency and loving homes. I also contemplate how our support group could be enlarged with faith families. <laughs> I wonder and I pray, how could fostering a child be a transformative experience? What does fostering or adopting reveal about the love of Jesus? Without a doubt, it's sacrificial and it's risky. So last Saturday, a group of us went to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families in West Seattle to do a mural project, and boy, did we learn a lot working together. We learned it was an honor to be invited as a trusted partner into this space, and we discovered when we went, there were no signs. It's a place where privacy is completely protected. Since there was no way to preview this space, we discovered the six visitation rooms were a bit bigger and much darker gray than were previously described. <laughs> we learned these rooms are the only space in the whole state of Washington for children who have been removed from their homes to meet with their biological parents for supervised visits with a, with a social worker watching through the window. And they're open six days a week from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Six dark gray, dark gray rooms, six days a week. So together, we discovered the drive to accomplish this tremendous painting project all in one day. Because it deeply mattered. It deeply mattered. Students from SBU, faculty, youth, seniors, even someone from our foster support group, came together and they gave deeply of themselves. Even, there's even more than was pictured there. So the supervising social worker kept saying, in all these years, I never realized how dark these rooms had been until I saw the change. It was such a privilege to pray a blessing over this space that all who enter would feel a sense of comfort and hope. So here are our works illuminating our faith, opening doors and relationships in our city that give more opportunities for more creative and faithful actions. Are you ready? Are you ready to make your faith come alive? Are you open to building new relationships for Jesus? Have you discovered those sweet spots of wholehearted service to God and others? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we long to do the things that really make a difference in the lives of people. Things that draw people closer to you, especially those on the margins. But we confess that our fear often gets in the way. Fear that we are not enough, not old enough, not educated or trained enough. We don't have the right words. We're just not good enough. We confess when it comes to big problems we see around us, like homelessness, and addiction, prostitution, issues in foster care. We get easily overwhelmed and quickly turn away to our safe spaces. We do not want to face that brokenness. We confess the busyness of our lives the tyranny of the urgent it gets in the way of our desire to put our faith into action, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, awaken us to the work you would have us to do. Help us discover those sweet spots where you have equipped each of us to powerfully respond with the love, hope, and healing of Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us all that we need to do your will in Christ Jesus. We, glor we love and glorify you. Amen. 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 We give thanks to God for that word that comes forth today. I'll be sharing with you in a moment ways we can respond, even this morning, to the word we've heard proclaimed in our midst. In this moment, let's continue in prayer as we pray a blessing over these elements as we share in Holy Communion together. Please join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, how we do give you thanks. 
Thanks for this opportunity in which you call us deeper into our own faith and action for the sake of Jesus Christ. We ask God for your empowering blessing to be with us, but we also pray, God, that as your people, we would hear your call, that we would listen attentively to the voice of your Holy Spirit speaking and moving in our own lives. We thank you for Jesus, who has not only given us an example, but who has come and lived and died and is resurrected so that we might be his people in this age. And God, it is indeed a broken age in which we live. Lives that are shattered by human trafficking, slavery, involuntary service, sex trafficking. God, we recognize that the systemic issues that face this nation and world are moments for us to respond with love and grace. And we thank you for Jesus' example, that even in the moments of his greatest brokenness, he offered himself fully and completely out of love for us. We remember the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us and how he took bread and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. And when the supper was over, the Lord Jesus took the cup and after he returned thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We give you thanks, God, for Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, that in him we might have life and life abundant so that we might share that life with the world. We pray and ask all of this in his mighty and holy name as he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we break this bread, we recognize that it is in Christ's brokenness that we are made whole. And when we give thanks over this cup, we remember that the love, the grace, and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus is offered to all of us and to the whole world. We invite you to come and to receive. I'd like those who are assisting me, if they'd please come forward at this time to help with Holy Communion. I'll remind you that in the Free Methodist Church, our communion table is open to everyone. So we invite all who are with us this morning to come and to share in Holy Communion. We have two different ways you can receive communion. One, and that will be serving you by tearing off a piece of bread and giving it to you, and then you can dip it into the cup of grape juice to receive the elements. Or if you'd prefer, we have both regular communion elements and gluten-free communion elements on the small table here at the center. So as you come forward to the center aisle, I remind you to drop off your Connect card and your offering in the small boxes that you might see there. And then come forward and receive communion in a way that is most comfortable to you so that you can share in this table that Christ has set for us. We'll be ready for you to come in just a moment. So please prepare your hearts and your minds and your lives to experience the very presence of Jesus Christ. Surrender I 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for meeting us in this meal, which we might be empowered to serve you, to give our lives for others as you've given your life for us. Bless us, feed us, and sustain us, not only here, but throughout every day, that we might be sustenance for others. We thank you, now and always, for the honor and privilege to gather in your name. Amen. When we gather for worship, there's always a moment we pause to think about how we're going to take action and what we're going to do because of the word that we've heard in our own lives. And this is important work for us as a church that we've heard Pastor Camille talk about. And there's a variety of ways that you can be engaged in that work over the coming weeks, even coming hours, even in the next few minutes. And so you saw some pictures during the sermon of the, the storeroom on the fourth floor where we keep all of the supplies that we often give to foster families and foster children. We have an open house in that space today. And so if you'd like to go up to the fourth floor to see it, what I'll ask you to do is meet in the, the corridor outside this brick wall over here. And the easiest way is to exit the sanctuary, go through the foyer to the left, and then kind of loop around into a hallway back here. And right there, you'll find the stairs and the elevators that will take you up to the fourth floor so you can see the space where we store all of the things that we use to share with those who are a part of our ministry in fostering hope. After this worship service is over as well, in the upper fine center, which is that same hallway, and just keep walking straight into the building that is attached over the walkway, uh, we have lunch provided for those who want to learn more about fostering hope and how they can be engaged. So you're welcome to attend and we hope to see you there. Pastor Camille will be leading our time there. I'll be joining her as well. So we hope to see you over there in a few minutes. We also want to let you know that, you know, the mural, the project of painting those rooms over in West Seattle, Seattle, where the visitation occurs, that's going to continue. And it's going to happen next Sunday, October 9 at 2 p.m. And rather than painting, we're going to be putting some beautiful, I would say, decals on the wall. Uh, we're probably not going to put fat heads of Seahawks players on the wall, but we are going to put some beautiful decals on the wall to make those rooms really look nice for the families that come. So if you're able and free next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock to head down to West Seattle for a short time uh, to finish up that work in those rooms, it would be very, very much appreciated. 
In the foyer, as you leave today, we have a display table set up for Fostering Hope. We have all kinds of information out there where you can learn more about how you can be engaged in our work of doing that. And if you want to make a special gift, financial gift to Fostering Hope, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can uh, make out a check, if you will, for those of you who still use the checkbook. We have these boxes right here where you can just write a check out to the church and put Fostering Hope on the memo line or on the envelope and drop it in here. You can also visit the Fostering Hope website that our church holds where you can make a gift there. It's at fosteringhopeseattle.org slash help. fosteringhopeseattle.org slash hope, or help, sorry. And there you'll be able to make a donation to support the work of Fostering Hope, but you'll also find the variety of needs that that program has in terms of supplies and donations that you might be able to collect to help support our work there as well. The last thing I wanted to share with you very quickly is that two weeks from today, on October 16, before this worship service, before the bridge, we're going to have a time of meeting together with our youth and our young people. And that's going to start at about 10 o'clock, and we're going to invite all of our middle school and high school youth to come and gather over in uh, the youth room area of the Lower Fine Center. It's uh, the main doors that come into the office, just walk straight, and it's on the left, kind of across from where the gym is. And our youth are going to gather there to meet with Pastor Stephanie to talk about some of the next steps we're taking with youth ministry. And so if you're a parent and say, what am I going to do when I bring my kid here for an hour? Well, I'm going to meet with you for a little bit of time over in one of the conference rooms. So I'll invite all of you who have middle school or high schoolers in your home, or you or yourself are in middle school or high school, to come at 10 o'clock on October 16th, two weeks from today. Youth in the youth room. Parents will meet with me. We're going to have some good conversation about the next steps in our youth ministry in the life of this church. Very important work, and we want you to be engaged in it. So we hope you'll join us for that. Pastor Camille, did I cover everything? Okay, I got two thumbs up this morning. That's a great day for me. All right, so I'm going to invite all of you as you're able to please stand, and uh, Ed, please lead us as we join in the closing song.
have the presence and example of Jesus always with us. We have the Holy Spirit equipping and inspiring us. And we have the Creator God filling us with his heart for loving people. We are fully empowered to put our faith into action and to serve the world. Yes, we are. Go in peace.